the longer I do this life thing, the, the older I get, the more I start to realize that life is kind of this series of changes. It's this series of changes of mind, changes of opinion, turnarounds. I find the, the farther I go and the longer I journey, the more things I come to see differently. I come to change my opinion. I, the things that I once thought as a child, I no longer think. I don't think that way. I, I turn my opinion. I change my ways. I change how I think. I find the older I get, the more I'm aware of how I'm changing. I'm changing everything about my life day by day. I think that's part of what maturity is. I think that's part of what it means to grow up and to, and to, to get a better handle on how to do this thing called life. If you continue to do the things that you did when you were five, that's not going to help your longevity. I, I think about some of the things that I used to think were fun as a kid. Now I think are dangerous, right? Some of the things that I would have thought was a good time. Some of the things I think are funny, I don't think are funny anymore. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You start to change. I think the times I noticed the biggest, most drastic changes in my life had to be around that time. I like You grow up really fast from about the age... 18, 19, 20, you're kind of out of high school, you're into college, and then if you get married, you kind of just shoot into overdrive. You start to get a little, just mature, you have to just grow up, and you start to change your ways a little bit. I remember going from being a bachelor who played video games till three in the morning at college and didn't really clean up after myself, you know, washing your bedding was optional, yeah? You know, some of those gross 19, 20-year-old guy things. And then I, I met this beautiful woman named Melanie, and we fell in love, and we got married. And, you know, poor Melanie, she, we got married, and I, I moved in with a woman who had been living on her own and quite successful on her own. I'm doing just fine before I met you. Guys, you want to meet a girl like that. She doesn't need you. You get her. Yeah? Amen? No? Anyway, and, and we got married, and uh, she, we had, I had to learn how to live with somebody else. I had to kind of change my ways. I had to pick up after myself, and I had to do what I said I was going to do. You, you have to start to change and adapt. I think the biggest changes happen, though, not from going from single to married, but from being married with no children to being married with children. Can I get an amen? There is no baptism by cold water quite like having your first child. It absolutely upsets everything. It just changes everything. Your, your, your whole life, you just mature in a moment. It's, it's interesting. I was thinking about this one time. It's like the moment that one child enters the earth, another one has to leave. Right? You can't be a kid anymore. And I remember just how fast things change. I remember that being in that first couple months with our oldest daughter, Ava, who's almost 10. I can't believe that. And I remember the first couple months, like, any, any new parents, you, you know, remember the time where you're just fighting for, like, any sleep at all, right? And it's, it's like when you get two hours of uninterrupted sleep, you, you actually look at each other and you high-five and you feel like you just, like, you just won the lottery. Like, I feel amazing. I got a full two hours last night. It feels great. And I remember one time my phone rang, and it was nighttime, and I, I answered my phone, and it was an old friend on the other line. He said, hey, man. Uh, there's a band playing in town. You want to go in and check them out? And I paused for a second, and I go, I looked at the clock. I said, dude, do you have any idea what time it is? It's 9.30. <laughs> I have been asleep for an hour. You have to grow up. You have to change. You have to make changes. Your, your life actually depends on learning how to adapt and change how you think. You don't think the same way today as you thought yesterday. And my hope today for some of you, actually for all of us, is that we would change and come to a realization that in Jesus there is a way unto life that is unmatched and will not be found anywhere else. That in Jesus you have the opportunity to come to life. And my hope is that today might be one of those days where you start to change how you go about your life in this season and that you find it in Jesus. I want to ask a question today, and it's the question that Easter asks all of us. I know Easter can maybe be confusing. Maybe it just seems like this religious holiday that you know it's about Jesus and you go to church and stuff, but really what is this whole thing about? Okay, Jesus died on the cross and he rose again. What does that have to do with you and me? Well, Easter asks a question and it makes a statement. It makes a statement about Jesus, and it asks a question to you and I. It's interesting. I love this, this story of these women who were followers of Jesus, and they had been on a, a wild ride. 
If you've been following along or you read any of the Gospels, you'll find out from different accounts that Jesus had been ministering for about three years. He had a public ministry. He was teaching and preaching and, and showing people the reality of the kingdom of God and showing people what life really is supposed to look like. And he was gaining this following and more followers. And then things took a sudden turn and people thought things were happening wrong. But in fact, it was all part of Jesus's plan. He went into Jerusalem and he said, I'm going to turn myself over to the authorities and I'm going to let myself be beaten, humiliated, shamed and crucified. And I'm doing it for your salvation. And on the third day, I'll rise again. But the disciples just weren't getting that Jesus was going to do this. And so they watched as their, the one who they thought was going to be the Savior of the world, they watched as he died, and their hopes were dashed, destroyed. They thought they'd reached a dead end in this one Jesus. And so we find on this Sunday morning, these women going back to the tomb to put spices on the dead body, what they thought was going to be the dead body of Jesus. Now, the reason they went on Sunday and not Saturday is because these were good law-abiding Jews, and on Saturday was the Sabbath, and you can't do anything. You can't work on Saturday. So they watched him die, and they buried him on Friday, and then they waited until Sunday morning to go back and take the spices. And so it says very early in the morning, they showed up at the tomb. Now, get the picture in your mind. This isn't what we know as graves. This is not like a, a hole in the ground in Jesus' day. And in fact, we actually know that it was a man named Joseph of Arab a rich man who donated his tomb to Jesus because he was convinced that Jesus was more than just a prophet. And so he donated his tomb, and the tomb was actually like a cave dug out of a, of a cliff face. And so they would put a stone over the front of it. And so picture this. It was actually something that you could walk down into where they would lay the body to rest. And so these women show up very early on Sunday morning and they go there and they, to their shock, they find the door to the tomb, the stone had been rolled away. And so they go in to examine and they go in and they walk down into the tomb and they can't believe it, the body's gone. And so in other accounts, we find out that they assume that some grave robbers or someone has come in to steal the body. And so there they are, scratching their heads, standing in this place where they thought they would find someone who was not there. They thought they'd find something that was not there. And so picture this. Here are these ladies standing in this dead end, scratching their heads, figuring out, well, what do we do next? And then all of a sudden, the Bible says that two men, now we know from other accounts, other accounts call them angels, Two men appeared in dazzling, bright, white clothes. And they, they asked this question, and I kind of like just the attitude, and they got a little, bit of, a little bit of flair in their question. They asked this question and simultaneously make a statement. It's both a question and a statement. They say to the ladies, they say, why are you looking for the living in a dead place? What you're looking for, they are saying, is not here. You came here to find something. I want to tell you that what you came to find, you are standing in a dead end. This is a dead end. You know what? He's not here. What you are looking for is not here. And they ask this question. It's such, a, it's such a pertinent question. This is the question of Easter. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. I love this. Now, if you're an English teacher or you're a grammar nut, that's going to bug you. Because it seems like at one point they're talking about a subject and they're talking about a someone. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. And you see, the angels are making this bold statement about Easter. They're saying, you are looking in a dead end. You came here to find life. You came here to find something, to find someone, but he is not here. Life went that way. This is a dead end. This is a dead place. You ever shown up in your life? You ever found, you ever kind of hit a wall? This for those of you who are new to King's Church, this can be a two-way conversation. This will go much faster if you just let me know that you're out there. Have you, ever, uh, have you ever hit a wall? Have you ever come to a point in your life where you just kind of, you found a dead end? You, you were driving down a road and going, you were on a certain journey. You, maybe it was in a relationship. Maybe it was in some kind of uh, career pursuit. Maybe it was some type of passion or hobby. And you kept chasing it until one day you woke up and you found out what I'd hoped to find here is not here. 
And so I guess maybe I got to go this way. Maybe it's time to turn around. This is what the, the angels are basically saying to these ladies. What you thought you'd find is not here and will not be here. This is a dead end. This is a dead place. This is a grave. This is a hole in the ground. Life went that way. Life has a name. His name is Jesus. He's risen. It's such a bold claim, this claim that Jesus rose from the dead. If Jesus rose from the dead, it does mean that he backed up everything that he said he was going to do. He backed up who he said he was. Make no bones about it. Jesus full on called his shot. He Babe Ruth that thing. I am going to die on a cross for the sins of mankind. He said, I am God in the flesh. He called it. He said, I'm going to die for all of you, and then I'm going to rise again in victory. And so the, the, the claim of Easter and the claim of these angels is not just that Jesus rose. This is not just some trick of a magician. This is a bigger claim than that. It means that Jesus is the king over death. It means that no power in heaven or earth or hell has the power to hold Jesus. That Jesus is the Lord of life. That's incredible. It means that nothing can come against Jesus. It means that he conquered the greatest powers in the universe. The powers of sin, death, and hell. Jesus rose from the dead. That's why in Revelation chapter 2, there's this vision. And Jesus stands there and he says this, Behold, I am the, I am the living one. I'm the living one. Behold, I was dead and now I'm alive forevermore. What's he saying? He's saying, I am the king, death is not. I am the king, fear is not. I am the king, sin is not. I am the king, shame is not. I am the king of kings and Lord of lords. That's who Jesus is. So, so Easter makes this claim that Jesus himself is the Lord of life. That life is found in his hand. And so now you have to pair that question with that statement. If Jesus is life, hang with me, if Jesus is life, then the question has to be, if all life is found in Jesus, if all power is found in Jesus, if the power of creation, we, we read it earlier in Colossians, that, that in him all things were created and find their being, that by him and for him things have come into being, that he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. If Jesus is the Lord of life, then here's the question. What are you doing looking for life in a dead place? What are you doing? What am I doing looking for life in anything, anyone, anywhere else than in Jesus. He is the invitation to the life that you're looking for. And all the pursuits of your life, every road that you travel, all of those chases, all of those things that you're hoping to find, they're all dead ends. There is a new way, and his name is Jesus. See, Jesus is the way to life. Jesus is the road that doesn't lead to disappointment. Did you know that? Jesus is the, he's the road that does not lead to a dead end. He broke through the dead end called death. He is the road that leads to life. In fact, at one point he said, I am the way. I am the way to life. See, a lot of us, we hit dead ends in this pursuit of life where we try to find things that bring us meaning. You know from the day you were born, you were made to more than just exist. We aren't zombies. We aren't animals. We know that, that life is more than just eating, sleeping, breathing, procreating, and dying. We know that. We know that we were created for more, every one of us. We were made for meaning, for significance, for vitality, for joy. And all of us, from the day we're born, live trying to find those things because there is a chasm, a, ca a capacity inside of our soul that hungers and yearns for those things, for, for vitality, for meaning. For We want to more than exist. We look for life, and so we do it in a variety of ways. Some people have this sense that it's, it is God. There's a God out there. There's a higher power to be obtained. And so this is where religion comes from. What is religion? Religion is human effort to reconcile the gap between us and God. That's what religion is. It's a human thing. It's maybe this thing that we stack morality on top of itself. If I do these things, I will get back to God and I'll find that higher power that I know exists out there and I'll satisfy the longing in my soul. I'll get to God. That's what religion is. Do you know that? 
Whether it's in, in morality or mentality, some religions really focus on intellect and knowing things. This is what it means to, to reach nirvana, to kind of ascend to another place. Uh, that's what religion's trying to do. It's trying to get to God. But some people don't believe in God. They, they think that the, the power that they need is found on the earthly plane. So maybe instead of trying to get to God, they don't do that, but they build towers or they build careers or they build a platform. Or they build something to elevate, to, to get up. Every one of us have this search. Maybe for some of us, it's not, it's not success, it's a someone. We attach ourselves to people and we, we try to find life and meaning and vitality out of relationships. And so, so lane after lane and road after road and pursuit after pursuit, we look for things that will bring us to life. And yet, if you've lived even more than 20 years on planet Earth, you'll know that we come to a lot of dead ends, don't we? And sometimes the greatest disappointments in our lives aren't our failures. They're our successes when we realize we reached our goal and it didn't satisfy the hole in my heart. This is what's so shocking when we see so many celebrities flame out and CEOs and people that we would say, that person has it all. And when they turn around and they tell us by their actions or their words that, no, I'm at the top and I'm still as empty as you are. I thought it was so telling reading that quote from the actor Jim Carrey not too long ago. And he, he said something along the lines of, I wish everybody could just achieve all of their wildest dreams and realize upon achieving them that it's not the answer. It won't make you any happier. You see, there is a hole in your soul that only God can fill and satisfy. And so a lot of us live our lives in pursuit to try to satisfy that hole to get to God. But here is the amazing news about Easter. Here's the amazing news about the gospel. You don't have to get to God. God got to you in Jesus. That eternity, that glory, that life, that vitality, that joy, that meaning, that substance, that glory that is inside of us that we long for, it has come to you in the person of Jesus. So heaven is not a place that you need to get to. Heaven came to you in the person of Jesus. That's amazing. Life has come. John, the, the, the apostle who followed Jesus for three years, he said it like this, that in the beginning was the Word, talking about Jesus, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and he said this, that, that, that the Word, Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. What's he saying? That life itself put on flesh and came to us so that we could have life. This brings a different meaning to John 3.16. Maybe you have it on a coffee mug or you're a wrestling fan and you've seen Austin 3.16 or what have you. It's that famous scripture that we just kind of blow by, but you got to understand it in this context. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish. No more dead ends. No more disappointments. But you will have eternal Life, the word eternal in there is this Greek word zoe. Some of you guys named your kids zoe and you don't even know what it means. Zoe means life. Don't let anybody tell you that Jesus came for any other reason other than that you would have life and life to the full. That is why he came. He did not come so that you could feel bad about your past and clean up your act and be a good person so that someday you might get to God and he might let you into heaven. It's so much more than that. Life came down. Glory came down. He has a name and he came here for you that you would have life and life to the full. This is what he said in John 10, 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to lead you to dead ends. Jesus came that you would be alive. Not just forever, I mean now. Like you'd find that meaning. Let me tell you, I gotta preach this for a second. The meaning that you are looking for, the joy that you are looking for, the vitality, the substance that you are looking for in life is found in no one else than Jesus. So let me ask the question again. Why do you look for the living among the dead? What are some graves, some tombs that you are hoping to find life when life went that way? His name is Jesus. You see, Easter asks this question, and it, it provides this incredible answer for all of our disappointments in life. Jesus is the fulfillment we are looking for. Easter doesn't just talk about our disappointments, though. It also deals with our dysfunction. A lot of us don't just live trying to find life. A lot of us live trying to fix up our brokenness, too. You see, I think if we're quiet long enough and we stop to think about it and we just are alone with our thoughts long enough, we realize the unfortunate reality about ourselves is that we are broken, frail, fragile creatures. That we are 
I guess the Bible says it like this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What's sin? Sin is dysfunction. Sin is brokenness. Sin isn't just something that you do. Sin is something that is in you that causes you to break and break up. Jesus came to actually deal with our brokenness, our sinfulness. It's more than just that he came that we have life and fulfillment, but he came to fix our brokenness. Isn't that incredible? He didn't just come to call your broken, busted self to some new version, some new lifestyle. He called to actually fix you up from your busted, broken past. That's what the cross is. The cross is that place where Jesus says, you know what, all of your striving, all of the things that you're trying to do to fix yourself up or project a certain image, try to deal with your shame, your sense of guilt, your sense of regret, your sense of validation and vindication, all those things that you do in this world to try to satisfy those things, you can keep doing it. You're going to hit dead ends. I came to do those on your behalf. That's what the cross is. The cross is the place where Jesus died our death, took our punishment, bore our shame. This is what it means in Isaiah 53 where it says he was wounded for not his transgressions. Whose? Ours. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Your grandmother, the preacher, every one of us. Jesus was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. On him, God laid the sins of us all. So Jesus came to deal with our dysfunction, with our brokenness, to offer us forgiveness. This is how we know we can be set free. This is how we know we can be made new. Jesus came not just to be the way, but to be the truth. The truth that says, you know what? There's some things about you that are broken, but I came to make you whole and make you new. There are some things about you that you are guilty of. I came to to not condemn you, but to acquit you and set you free. That's what the cross does. The cross says debt paid forgiven, set free. I do not condemn you. That's what the cross is. The cross is that place that tells us the whole truth about us. The truth that says, you know what, there's some things about you that that left to yourself, that's broken and that's busted. But when you come to the cross, you receive a new truth. You exchange your old, broken, bustedness and you take on the righteousness of Christ. It means that you're made brand new. He becomes the truth for you. He becomes your vindication. He becomes your validation. He becomes your justification. That's the message of the gospel. So so here's the question again. Why do you seek the living among the dead? So many of you live trying to deal with your past. Whether it's something you did or something done to you. You're trying to fix it up. You're trying to cover it up. You're trying to make it make sense. You're trying to reconcile it and redeem it. And yet over and over, it just feels like you're, you're making more of a mess. And, and so the angels would say to us today, and the Easter would say to us, why do you look for the living among the dead? Come out of the tomb. Leave the past behind. There is a brand new life for you in Jesus. He set you free from the past. You can step into a brand new you. That's amazing news for some of you. Some of you, you live in the shadow and the darkness of your past every single day, and there is a Savior standing outside of the grave of your life saying, come on, life's not in there. Life's out here. Why do you look for the living among the dead? Last idea I want to share, and I'll I'll be done. I, I told you I'd be done quick. Jesus doesn't just come. Easter isn't just here to deal with our past and fix us of our brokenness. He's not just here that we find fulfillment in our today. Although both those things are true, he actually came so that we have hope for the future. You see, Jesus isn't just the way. He's not just the truth. Jesus said, I am the life. I'm the life everlasting. This is more than just a present hope. This is more than just a fix for your past. This is the hope for the future that says that even as Jesus died and rose again, the same power that raised Christ from the dead now dwells in me and will give life to my body when I die. Listen. We're Christians. Those of us who are Christians, we don't just believe this is some self-help thing for this life. This is the promise of eternal life forever and ever and ever. You see, Easter deals with the question of our own mortality. In case you haven't thought of this recently, you have a date with death. You're going to die someday. Welcome to King's Church. I hope you feel uplifted and you feel like you've... That's true. There's coming a day where you'll breathe your last. And so what, do you, what is your hope after that moment? 
that you, you cease to exist. I don't believe that's the case. I, I believe that we're eternal beings and you will exist somewhere forever and ever and ever. And the hope of the gospel is that even though you die, if you die in faith in Jesus, you die into an eternal life that will never fade, perish, or spoil. And that takes the fear of death out of the, out of the picture. How many of us live, you, you would not believe how many of the decisions in your life are actually mo- motivated by some deep-seated fear of death, some idea of self-preservation. You see, the resurrection of Jesus and the promise of eternal life actually sets you free from the fear of death. It was funny, just this morning... I was hanging out with the band before uh, this service, and we were talking about music. And I said, you know what? I I want that Vince Gill song, Go Rest High Upon That Mountain. Could one of you sing that at my funeral? I said, and, uh, and, and Kelly, just being kind because she's kind, she said, oh, let's not talk about your funeral. That's, that's kind of a buzzkill. And, and, and I said, today's a great day to talk about my funeral. You know why? Because today's the day I remember that even if I die, if I die in Christ, I'm alive forevermore. So let's talk about it. Do you want to to be the worship leader? (laughs) You see, my, my hope is built not just on the death of Christ, but the resurrection and and the promise. He said it like this in John chapter 11. He was having a conversation with Mary and Martha who lost their brother and they're weeping at his graveside because all of us deal with loss, don't we? This isn't just hope for us. It's hope for for those we love that as they come to know Jesus, they're promised eternal life too and we get to spend forever with them and with Christ. And so here's Mary and Martha weeping at this tomb, at this graveside. And Jesus comes to them and, 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 and says this. He says in John chapter 11, he says to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, ah, yeah, 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 I know. Someday in the end we'll be all happy, happily ever after. That's essentially what she's saying. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. This is what we believe. We believe that Jesus actually rose in body. This is not some story. We're not talking about Middle Earth here. This isn't Star Wars. This isn't some fable. We believe that the man Jesus died a real death and rose in real victory. And he offers us that same real victory so that when you die, you die with hope, knowing that if he's able to raise himself, he's able to raise me too. Isn't that incredible? Breathe out. So why do you live in that grave of fear? Why do you live in that grave of self-preservation? Jesus is risen. Life went that way. His name is Jesus, and it's life eternal. That's reason to celebrate. Can I get an amen? Amen. Why doesn't everybody just stand to your feet? Stand to your feet really quick. I'm going to be done. Every so often, I'll be driving. And let me know if this happens to you. We can be honest. I'll be driving along. And I'm heading somewhere. You're behind the wheel. And I'm heading somewhere, and I, 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 I set out believing I know where I'm going. I know the way. I got it. And I'm driving. I see some smirks already. I see some elbows. I see some wives going like this. Like, that's you. That's you. And I'm driving along, and I'm confident. I know the way where I'm going. And I'm driving along, and it could be five minutes, maybe ten minutes. Admittedly, it's been up to an hour of, <laughs> of driving along. And starting to see some things pass by that are starting to be subtle hints and indications that I might not be going where I think I'm going. But I'm incredibly stubborn. Like, I'm amazingly good at silencing that voice of reason. Anybody else? Like, no, shut up. I don't want to hear from you. I know where I'm going. I don't want to hear from my wife, who's this co-pilot. I don't want to hear from Siri. Neither one of the girls in my life have a say. I'm driving. I'm the man. I got this. And so I'm driving along, and so, again, sign after sign. I'm like, I'm pretty sure that town's not where you're supposed to be going, and I'm pretty sure that wasn't. And so sign after sign and hint after hint and indicator after indicator is passing me by. And then over time, enough evidence gets mounted that I am actually going the total wrong direction. Has anybody ever done this? Like, you you finally admit defeat, and you're like, and you, what do you do? Put the blinker on, you pull over, you take a deep breath and realize I have been going the wrong way. I've come to the end of the road. And then what do you do? You look over your shoulder and you turn the car around and you head the opposite direction. Some of you need to do that with your life. 
Some of you have been driving down a road thinking you're going somewhere where you are not currently going, thinking you're going to find something that's not there. And so Easter's asking you the question, whether it's for significance, some of you are chasing a, a dream for your business and you think that when my business gets to here or I just have this much money or if I can just have this much in my retirement savings or if I can just be married or if I can just have kids or if I can just, you know, whatever you want to fill that blank in, the Easter would ask this question. You fill in the blank with whatever you want. As long, if, until that name is Jesus, you are seeking the living among the dead. You are looking for life in something that cannot bring you the life you're looking for. Some of you are living to try to fix up your past. You're trying to make amends. You're trying to find peace. You're trying to find justification and validation and vindication. And you're driving down the road of life trying to, trying to make, it, make things right and fix yourself up and project a certain image. And, and the, the message of Easter would be saying this, turn around. Life's not there. You can't pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Stop living another day in the, in the grave of condemnation and guilt and shame when the cross of Jesus calls us freely by the grace of God into a brand new life. Turn around. Some of you are living in constant fear, and some of you, maybe you're getting to a season, or maybe you're dealing with terminal illness. And you're wondering, what's going to happen when I die? And so you're, you're living in the fear of death. You're living in this mode of self-preservation. You're making decisions based on fear and not on faith. And Jesus calls you out of that grave too, saying, hey, come out of there. You don't need to be afraid. I am the risen one. I hold the keys of death and hell. Anybody who dies in me will never die. They will live forever and ever and ever. And so here's my invitation to all of us today. What are some graves, what are some tombs that you have run into with your life and you hear the voice of Jesus calling you out of the grave saying, I am risen. Life's not in there, it's out here. Follow Jesus and find life. That's the simple invitation. And it's there for every one of us. For some of you, you need to, you need to do a U-turn with your life for the first time ever. For the rest of us, Easter serves as a great reminder that we have this incredible ability of driving off track. Off track. Can I get an Amen. It's amazing how you can start to look for life in all the wrong places, even though you know the gospel. And here's the great news. God's mercy is new every, every morning. Jesus never gives up on us. He never runs out on us. And even today, he's saying, hey, 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 turn around, turn around. You know life's not found there. Come back to me. Give your life to me and find the life you're looking for. That's the good news of Easter. So let me ask you the question once more. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not there. It is not there. He is risen. His name is Jesus. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to pray a prayer today. And we're going to just pray it out loud. Christians, people who have already accepted Jesus, or maybe you're doing this for the first time. But today is a day where we're going to do a verbal U-turn. We're going to U-turn our lives. We're going to turn around and set our lives on the road, the way, the truth, and the life that is Jesus. We're going to find our lives in Jesus. And so we're going to do that by faith. The Bible says in Romans that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You don't have to pay amends. You don't have to pay your dues. You don't have to take a class. You just have to proclaim by faith, I believe, Jesus, I give you my life, and I want the life you have for me. And that's it. It's as simple as that. And so I'm going to pray, and I want you to repeat after me out loud like you believe it. If it's for your first time or the thousandth time or the ten thousandth time, what have you. Let's proclaim today that we find life in no one else but Jesus Christ. Would you repeat after me? Dear Jesus, I believe that you came. I believe that you died. You died my death for my sins. Say it like you mean it. I believe that you rose in victory. And today, I hear you calling my name. And I'm coming out of the tomb in Jesus' name. I give you my life and receive the life that you have for me. Today and forevermore, amen. With every head bowed, still, every head bowed and eyes still closed. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, we want to celebrate with you. And, and the Bible says that you need to boldly proclaim. You need to, pro, you need to confess and, and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. And so if you made that decision today for the first time ever, or maybe, you know what, you, you, you thought you were a Christian, you thought you were a believer, and you realized, you know, I believed in religion. I believed in some ideology. I didn't believe in a Savior or a someone, and today you're giving your life to Jesus. I want you on the count of three to raise your hand in the air and just testify to me and show, show Jesus 
Jesus today that you've decided to follow him. So when I get to three, I want you to shoot your hand up in the air. One, the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. Two, don't resist him. He's calling you out of the grave. Three, would you shoot your hand up in the air if that's you today? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Put your hand up if that's you. That's fantastic. That's good. Every head open, every head, eyes open. Let's celebrate in this place that Jesus is risen. People have made decisions today to follow him. Hey, he's risen. We have a great hope. His